we have our two wonderful candidates in the runoff for Congressional District 7, um, Lizzie Pinnell Fletcher. And Laura Mason. Um, so let me just, I guess before we get started, let me just say a couple of things. One, if you've got a cell phone, silence it. Really, really important, vibrate, whatever you need, just let's try to, try to keep it off as much as possible. Um, and, and let me just very quickly kind of break up what we're gonna do in terms of format. Um, it's a little bit different. This is like the 870th of joint appearance by the TV, something like that. No, um, there's been obviously a lot of forums. You guys have had an opportunity to hear a lot uh, from these candidates, but we want to try to do, uh, it, I think, is do it a little bit differently um, and more of a kind of a structured, de no, I shouldn't say structured, but more of a debate, right? Try to create some, the, the, the conversation out in the community that most people ask about is, they're both wonderful, what's the difference? So we want to, it's more about sort of the contrasts um, the differences, trying to get a sense so that voters have a, an idea of who they want to support, who's best for, or who's the best candidate for CD7 to beat John Culberson, right? So, so with that, let me kind of tell you what we're thinking of doing that's a little bit different. We're gonna have it in blocks. So we're gonna talk about maybe five to six topics. Um, each topic, we're gonna do it as a conversational, kind of five, uh, kind of 15 to 20 minutes. Um, talk about healthcare, and we'll go back and forth. I'll ask a series of questions to both of you. You can, if you, if either one of you wants to comment on the question um, or respond to what the other person says, by all means do so. Um, I will generally keep time to try to make it fair, so not one person. Keep your answers kind of the 60 to 90 second range. The more questions we can get, uh, the better. And so then we're gonna go from probably every 15, 20 minutes, we'll move to a different block. So with that, um, let's start off with kind of some stuff that we don't normally talk about since you guys have been to a lot of these, we've talked a lot about issues, but we want to sort of talk, start off and talking about kind of the politics of the race. So there's been a lot of conversation about sort of two competing, potentially competing views, the idea of who's the most progressive candidate and who's the most electable candidate. So. Let's let's talk about that, right? Because um, when you when you when other people have looked at your issue positions, you guys are really similar. In fact, that's probably a testament to Democrats in Harris County that there's a lot of commonality. So, if that's true, how could any one of you be more progressive or more electable than each other? So let's talk about that first, Lizzie. Why are you more electable? Because I think, in, in fairness, you're generally regarded. By, at least certainly by some of your folks, is that's a selling point, you're more electable, you get more moderate voters. If you and Laura have very similar positions, why are you more electable than she is? Well, thanks for the question, Jay. And I think that um, what we've really focused on on our campaign is that I have a great chance of beating John Culberson, in large part because of my experience and my track record working in this community. So I don't know if I would describe it as electability as much as um, a real relationship throughout the community. I have been living and working here pretty much since I got out of college. Uh, I did go back to law school, um, but spent my summers working here and started my law career here um, almost a dozen years ago now working at Vincent Elkins and have been at the law firm where I am now for almost nine years. Um, but I've been working in this community for almost 25 years as a volunteer, um, and I've been working as a professional. I have represented people from across the community, and when people come to my office and they need a lawyer, I don't ask them whether they're a Republican or a Democrat. I don't ask them those kinds of questions because my job is to represent them, and I have been working with them, um, being an effective advocate for them and a fighter for them on all kinds of issues, and I think that that has given me a real broad coalition of support that it's gonna take um, I've heard some comments before about the coalition, but we've put together an amazing team of Houstonians here because this campaign is all about getting this district where I have lived nearly all of my life, the representation that it deserves, and because of my track record of accomplishment in the community and my relationships with people throughout the community through my work, I have a great network of people who are ready to vote for me in November and vote against John Culberson. Okay, so... 
Do you want to comment? You want to comment on that, Laura? Sure. Well, I can give my pitch for yes, why. Yes, yes. Why are you more the, electable? Let's go with that. Well, because being more progressive and standing up for democratic values that the majority of Americans, Texans, and Houstonians share equals being more electable. We will not win this seat. We will not win this state. Can you hear me? Is it working? Okay. If we continue to try to attract only the mythical crossover voter, the only way we will win is if we build a bigger coalition of people who have felt left behind, who have not shown up before. Every day I'm out in the western end of this district, which by the way, we should have more forums there, um, of people who've never had their door knocked on, they've never been contacted, and even when they have, they don't really have a reason to vote. Because there's a sense that's you know, national that Democrats have kind of lost their way, that we don't really stand for what we used to stand for. But guess what? What we stand for is right. We are right on every single issue. I just, um, but we have to fight for it. I think the majority of Americans believe that you shouldn't drop out of society because you break your arm. You shouldn't you know, be afraid of your kids getting shot in school. 70% uh, of people, even in the state, believe that climate change is real and pose, poses a really existential threat to our survival. Um, we believe that international treaties are good. All of these things that are being trampled by the GOP majority right now, we need fighters who will stand up and get people you know, a reason to show up to the polls. And that's what I hear every day. I'm proud that we have 1,900 volunteers in a district that averages 9,000 voters in a Democratic midterm primary. It's all hands on deck. Democracy only works when more people participate. And I believe by standing up for Democratic values, which are also mainstream Texan values, I will win by getting people to show up. So, Jay. Okay. Oh, okay. You want every, you want him to stand before each response? Really? That, that's fine, but Jay, I would like to respond to that. Yeah, yeah, please, um, please do respond. Okay, so I'll stand up for this um, because I really take issue with what Laura said, that Democrats have lost their way. That may be a national narrative, but that is not what's happened in Harris County. And I've been living and voting in Harris County, and I know that we won in 2008, we won in 2012, we won in 2016 because we're running good candidates that can win. So I take issue with the idea that Democrats have lost their way. The Harris County Democratic Party has been doing a great job cycle after cycle. And we have a real opportunity here to unseat John Culberson. But don't think for a second that saying that you're the most progressive person and that you're a fighter is something that is, um, that I'm not gonna challenge because I'm a fighter and I've been fighting in this community for 25 years, standing up for Planned Parenthood, working to dismantle the school and prison pipeline, representing people in front of judges and juries for more than a decade, people from all walks of life, from across the, the socioeconomic spectrum, the political spectrum. I have been fighting for Houstonians. That's what I've been doing my whole life. And I will put my progressive record up next to anyone. I was on the board of directors of Planned Parenthood of Houston in Southeast Texas, and I put that on broadcast TV. I'm not afraid to talk about my progressive values, and I think that no one in this room believes that there is a substantial difference or that anyone is more progressive. What Jay said is there's a lot of similarity on the issues because these are the issues of our community. And I believe very strongly that our community will stand behind me because they are looking for someone that they can trust who knows this community, who has been a part of this community, and who has been working to make it better for years. To respond, I will say yes, Harris County is the most evenly divided um, pop large population county by Democrat Republican in the entire country. We are doing great. The best organizers in the country are here. My campaign manager who is not from here is staying here because she thinks if we flip Harris County, we flip the nation. And that is true. And people are doing amazing work here. But I'll tell you, when I'm knocking on people's doors in Bear Creek and Katy and Barker Cypress, I'm a fifth generation Houstonian. I've lived here. I have, I'm proud to have joined my husband when he was one of the first 20 people hired by Senator Barack Obama. I'm proud that we were involved in national politics as well. But when I knock on people's doors, this is not like common, you know, this is not Virginia before the Civil War. Like my Houston pedigree, yes, I am from this district, but that is not why people should vote for me. People should vote for me because I have a vision of how to help this city not just survive, but thrive. 
in a time when a lot of stuff is changing in our economy here, a lot of stuff is changing in our topography here, and we need a large-scale thinker who is going to fight for those changes that are already upon us. Do you consider yourself more progressive than Lizzie? Is that what, I mean, is that your position? Um, I consider myself more willing to, sorry. <laughs> I consider myself um, more willing to engage in the more difficult questions, like when Trump launched airstrikes in Syria. I would want to know, I want to know where my candidates stand on every issue, every current event as they come, and I think I am more willing to put myself out there. But I also question that there's no scale of who's more Houstonian, you know? Um, and I think the people, one out of four people in this county weren't born in this country. I've been going to mosques every week. Every member of the Muslim community I meet is just worried that they're going to be kicked out of this country. And those are, these are life or death issues, and it's not about where I was, you know, in 2010. So that's just my... And I own a house in the district as well. Lizzie, is that, is that your view that, that Laura, the fact that Laura moved back is somehow a, a, a bar from her being able to run for Congress here? No, and I've never taken that position. My campaign has always been about beating John Culberson. And I view John Culberson as the opponent in this race. I don't view Laura or any of the other seven Democrats that are vying for this spot as my opponent because we are all on the same side, which is perhaps why people say we're similar on the issues. We're Democrats. That's not a surprise. That was true. You know, when we had our other forums, there were seven people, and by the time you got to the seventh answer, people were kind of like, okay, you know, y'all are all kind of saying the same thing, which is perhaps why we're changing it up. I don't think that that is a qualifier or disqualifier, but I do think that having a track record in this community that people can understand and believe in is very important in convincing them to vote for a candidate, to know that I'm invested in this community and that I have a track record of fighting for Houstonians. I have been a fighter my whole life and that's what I do every day professionally. And I don't think that it's a disqualifier at all, but when I look out at why I think that I would be the best representative to take on John Culberson and to serve this community in Congress, it is because of my track record of accomplishment here in this community. It is because I've worked with Houstonians for years and it is because John Culberson is not present. He's not a part of this community. And I think that it's a great contrast to talk about what I've done for this community and compare it to his. Um, let's, let's, let's sort of shift gears here. We could, we could probably spend an hour going back and forth on just this. But um, let's, I'll, let me ask sort of two kind of quick questions on the politics side. One that's probably easy, one that might be a little harder. Um, uh, Majority, uh, Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi has announced that if, as we all expect, we're going to get win 25, 26 seats, she will be a candidate for Speaker of the House. Will you guys, uh, either of you, support her in her venture to be Speaker? Um, Let's start with, uh, with uh, Laura. Sure. Um, I think Nancy Pelosi is one of the best Democratic you know, leaders of, of the century. Uh, she made that decision for me when she okayed releasing an opposition memo on me on February 22nd. I think it is time for young blood, a new generation of leaders with new ideas. And we have plenty of them out there in the caucus, and I will you know, get behind them. All right, so that's, I'll, I think we all heard that as a no. Uh, <laughs> go ahead, Lizzie. Um, well, my answer to that question is probably um, that's putting the cart before the horse for me. I don't know who's going to be running for speaker. She certainly won, and I think that she's an incredibly effective leader of the caucus. But for me, I need to, I'm focused on getting there first um, and making sure that we can win this race and then seeing what the choices are when we get there. But I do think that she has been an effective leader and has, is responsible for things like passing the Affordable Care Act, um, that she's done a great job of corralling the Democratic caucus and that we should look at all of the choices and then make a choice in January. All right, so we'll, we'll put you down as a maybe. Um, all right, so in the, in the other sort of semi-easy question, um, there is, uh, uh, Congressman Al Green, of course, has talked about articles of impeachment against the President of the United States. Pure if Democrats are in the majority. Um, would you support that vote? Would you vote for uh, uh, issuing articles of impeachment against President Trump? Uh, let's start with Liz. So the lawyer in me is coming out when I say 
I've got to see the charges because right now I don't even know what the charges are and I would need to see the evidence. I've certainly seen enough to make me very concerned that impeachment is a very real possibility. But I think until we know what the charge is, because of course impeachment is for high crimes and misdemeanors and other um, acts, we need to know what the charge is and what the evidence is. I do have a great concern that we will see a lot of evidence that calls for impeachment, but until we see it, I'm not going to take a position on whether or not we need to to do it. But I have seen a lot of evidence that concerns me. All right. Uh, Laura? Uh, you already asked me this last week, and I said, day one, baby. Um, <laughs> yes, it would be good to have the full Mueller report, but we are his attacks on the free press and then the FBI alone show a contempt for the Constitution that is far beyond anything Bill Clinton did. Sign me up. All right, so uh, we're nearing the end of this first block. I just want to kind of uh, end it on the politics side to say, um, just in terms of, and you guys have all sort of addressed this a little bit. Um, you both call yourself progressives. You both have put together, just based on your amazing staffs working tonight, great campaigns. Um, you meet a lot of people, raise a lot of money. Why? What do you What do you see in your abilities to beat John Culberson? Um, yes, Hillary Clinton won this district. Every other Republican also won this district. Um, and so, why? How are you going to win? So let's do that. Ninety seconds each, and then we're going to the next block, which will be an issue topic. I can't remember. I think it's. I think it is you. Uh, well, it's Laura. I'm sorry. Um. Yes, John Culberson won this district. This is an R plus seven district. Just because Hillary Clinton also won does not mean that it is suddenly Nancy Pelosi's district. I'm going to win, as I already intimated, by assembling a coalition of new voters, of some of the young people who, in, who've come into my office and said, I want to do something. They admire how strong I've been on gun violence from the first day um, of this campaign. And I'm going to win because I'm a fighter. And somebody wants People in this district, including many Republicans, want someone who will pop it to John Culberson and who will, um, and who will take it to the map from day one. I believe I offer the greatest contrast to him and that the only way we will win, it is not, I repeat, by getting assembling the same coalition of elites. It is by assembling teachers and nurses and firefighters and steel workers and all the people who maybe haven't voted because it hasn't mattered yet. I, like, I plan to use my platform as a writer, as a communicator, to remind people why it matters so much and get them to the polls. It is the only way we will win. So Jay, I've given this question a lot of thought even before I got into the race. Is John Culberson beatable? Because of course Hillary Clinton won by a point and a half, but Mitt Romney won this district by 20 points. So we have a real challenge in front of us. We have a winnable seat, but how do we do it? And I do think that Hillary Clinton is the last Democrat that anyone can remember who won in this district. We need to look at that model and look at what happened. And I think that what we need to do is talk to every single voter in the district. New voters, old voters, people who voted perhaps differently before who haven't voted for a Democrat, people who vote across party lines, people who voted for Hillary Clinton. I think we need to not take any vote for granted. And I think that we have built a very strong coalition of people who can do that. And I know that, I, I'm not sure what Laura means when she talks about a coalition of elites. I've heard that a few times and it might be because um, I've gotten a lot of endorsements from people who have worked in this community for years, but I want to work with the people who've laid the groundwork and have been doing the work in this community for a long time. But I have a ton of high school students who come into my office every day. I'm working with Moms Demand Action Moms. I'm working with people across the community. I am working with volunteer firefighters and firefighters and all sorts of people in our community because that is what it's going to take. We need to leave no vote unturned and we need to do two things. We need to appeal to everyone and ask every single person in this district for their vote because the job of a representative is to represent every single person in this district. So we need to talk to everyone. <laughs> Second, the thing that we need to do and the question that I've asked for a long time is how can we win? And we need to run against John Culberson. We need to run against his record. And we're going to have the resources to do it this time, to get the message out, to educate voters on what John Culberson has failed to do. And we're going to really run against him and talk about why he has failed to represent us and how my track record as an advocate and a partner is exactly what we need in Congress. 
All right, so that ends our, uh, our politics roundtable conversation. So now let's, let's um, shift to some issues. The number one issue, uh, according to when you, when you poll individuals, poll the public, uh, poll voters rather, and poll, poll uh, just, just regular citizens, is healthcare. Continues to be the dominant issue regardless of party. So I, I wanted to ask, there's been a lot of conversation about it, um, but just try to get as specific as possible. Um, what's your position on single payer? I mean, are you, are you for a single payer system, um, not an insurance company based system, but a pure single payer system, national health care type thing? Let's uh, start with, actually let's start with Laura. Okay, this to circle back again, this is I believe, I, I'm interested to hear Lizzie's answer, but I strongly support a single payer system that gives every American access to health care. And I believe that is a differentiator. How we get there, there's a lot of good plans. I believe, you know, we're about 70 years too late to wake up tomorrow morning with, you know, the 2.5 million people who work for private insurance companies and the 150 million people who are privately insured just to go away. So I'm looking at a lot of the serious uh, democratic plans that would get, you know, provide an on-ramp to a single-payer system. And I think so far the most compelling one I've seen is um, Chris Murphy's Medicare for Everyone plan which basically allows any American to buy into um, the system that is Medicare. It would strengthen Medicare, it would be just paid for with, you know, on the Obamacare, sub with subsidies, premiums, people would pay for themselves, it would not add much to the debt, and it would make private insurance companies finally have to compete for the millions and millions and millions of dollars that they take from us. And it would also include cost, you know, cost caps like the proposing California, right now where there has to be strict limits on what we pay for healthcare. And I also believe that Medicaid, we need to raise the eligibility income threshold for Medicaid immediately. And that is done state by state, which means states like Texas will opt out, which is why Medicare for all for anyone is the beginning step toward a single payer system. But yes, I emphatically support that by any means necessary, however we get there. So, 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 you like, so you like the Murphy bill, which is a little bit different sort of than the Ellison bill. And the Murphy bill is basically the public option under Obamacare. Uh, just, just so we're clear here. Um, you, yeah, so I'd like yeah, to respond to that because I, I think that there's a lot of confusion about what we're talking about when we talk about healthcare. The first thing we need to talk about is what do we value? I believe that healthcare is a human right and that we need universal healthcare, not just healthcare coverage, not just healthcare insurance, but that we all need access to healthcare. And the plan that Laura just talked about is not a single payer system. That is the public option. That is keeping the Affordable Care Act in place and adding a public option. And that's something that I've been talking about on the campaign trail for months. I think we need to clear up the confusion. There are five competing Democratic plans, and I expect that there will be more by next January in Congress to deal with health care because this is the number one most pressing issue for all Americans. This is what people are talking about. But when you talk about moving to a single-payer system, the, there has been extensive study that the plan that Bernie Sanders has proposed will cost $32 trillion over 10 years, and we don't know how we're going to pay for it. And the other thing that I think is really important is when we talk about a single-payer health care system, Who's going to pay for women's health care? Who's going to pay for family planning coverage? Because we know that right now congressional Republicans are trying to pull back Title X funding from Planned Parenthood. And we know the Hyde Amendment prevents the federal government from paying for abortion services. So when we talk about having the federal government paying for all of our health care, where are women going to get our health care? The devil is in the details on all of these proposals. It's not sexy. It's not exciting. But the truth is we need to start with the Affordable Care Act. We need to build on it because the Affordable Care Act was a compromise that put a burden on the insurance companies, on the government, and on individuals to make sure that they were covered. And I think we need to make sure that we go back to having the insurance mandate because the Republican tax bill that repealed the individual mandate for health care insurance is going to seriously undermine our health care delivery even more. People aren't going to have access, the markets aren't going to function, and that's something that basically the Republicans in Congress have been trying to do since the Affordable Care Act was passed. We need a Democratic majority in Congress to make sure that we can build on the Affordable Care Act, that we can address what we have seen over the last eight years are its deficiencies, and that we can move forward to getting universal health care for everyone. Yeah, I just want to respond to that by saying if we've learned nothing from the last eight years, it's that incrementalism has failed us when it comes to health care. 
Um, it's not working. We thought when the Affordable Care Act was passed, again, I was, my husband worked in the White House at the time, that that would be the gateway to you know, Medicaid expansion in every state, Medicare lowering the age to 55, all of these great things would happen because once people got a little taste of what healthcare access was about, um, they, we would keep going forward and no one would ever be able to take it back. That actually did not prove, we did underestimate the intransigency of people like Mitch McConnell, but that didn't work. We need a more radical, forward-looking system that Im allows more people access to healthcare. And I don't think that we can fix the Affordable Care Act as it currently stands. I need, we really need to start over with a better, more expansive plan that puts more Americans on the road to single payer, and that's how we will get there. Okay, so, so just to be clear. And it might not be Chris Murphy's plan. Okay. But yeah. Yeah, just to be clear, you're saying you, you don't want to fit this in through Obamacare. You actually think we need, a, we need to scrap Obamacare and have a different system? I think Obamacare is so gutted at this point that if it were salvageable, we should try, but it's kind of gone beyond that. And I think the opportunity of the slow death of Obamacare is that it allows us, no one talked about single payer at all during the debates over Obamacare. It was not on the table at all. It was considered socialist and crazy, and now everyone's talking about it, and every serious Democratic contender for the presidency in 2020 is advancing some sort of single-payer plan, because that's what the American people want. That's what we deserve. We shouldn't be the only country that pays more for health care and gets less and have people you know, dying of unnecessary things every day. I have a friend from Houston who is a professor at the University of Toronto. She's had two C-sections and a brain tumor and hasn't paid a penny. And she lives in Canada and she would like to move back except for that reason. And there's too many people who are unfairly burdened by the high cost of healthcare in this country and we need to change that from the bottom up. So um, just break, I, I wanna sort of Break into some of the detail on healthcare, so we can so I can get a better understanding. So there's there's, there's a series of sub bills that are out there that are being talked about. The, the Women's Health Protection Act, for example. Um, have you guys? I assume you're all both going to have the same position on that, um, or is is there? Or are, is that something you guys will support or, or, or pledge to support? Well, um, as I think I've made clear, women's access to health care and to reproductive health care has been a priority in my life um, and something that I've fought for for the last 25 years. And I think that we do need to do everything that we can to protect women's access to care. Like I said, this morning or just this week, John Culberson signed a letter asking the Secretary of Health and Human Services to defund defund Planned Parenthood. Um, we need to do everything we can to make sure that women have access to affordable care. But I think that the idea um, that we're talking about with some of these other plans is incredibly destabilizing and the idea of abandoning the Affordable Care Act is um, something that we need to think about very seriously because what we have with health care is a crisis. People need health care and they need access to prescription drugs. They need to be able to get health plans that actually give them some kind of coverage. And what we're seeing now is to radically change that and to do something completely different is going to throw our entire system into chaos. And I don't think, I don't know how you can have a radical overnight change and also have an incremental um, phasing in of universal health care up to single payer. I mean, I think that what we're talking about with the Affordable Care Act is building on that. We have to remember where we were 10 years ago when we started passing the Affordable Care Act, when personal bankruptcies were at an all-time high, when people couldn't get coverage for pre-existing conditions, when insurance companies could drop people at any time. Those are things that the Affordable Care Act addressed and changed. And we need to see how much progress we've made and we need to build on that and move forward. Sure, yes. I, I also believe in the Women's Health Protection Act, and I've also been a loud defender of women's reproductive rights as a writer. When the DCCC this summer said they would recruit and fund anti-choice candidates, I am the only candidate who came out and said this is wrong, this is why Democrats lose. We have to stand up for women or we stand for nothing. And I believe that, you know, I wrote... Um, an email about when in 1993 when Bill Clinton was inaugurated, that same month he was inaugurated, I had a, um, I was diagnosed with a very serious heart condition. And I was very lucky to live in Houston, one of only two or three places in the entire country that could treat this condition. And at that time, Hillary Clinton was unrolling her, you know, Hillary care. 
And our healthcare system has been in crisis forever. You know, for, for my whole lifetime, you know, we missed an opportunity to incorporate real, you know, an expansion of Medicaid and Medicare 60 years ago. Obama made the greatest strides that have been made since FDR, LBJ in this, on this front, but we need to keep fighting for large changes to the system. And the only way, and we do have the political will to do that if we elect Democrats and have a Democratic Congress that runs on those values. Thank you. Um, I think what we want to do is sort of now that we've, we've, uh, we've talked about healthcare, is kind of shift gears to, to another sort of policy topic. Um, and what I want to do is sort of talk about the, maybe the, the most significant kind of existential crisis that the city and this community faced, uh, and that's Harvey. Uh, and, and talk a little bit about that. So what I, what I want to do is one of the questions that came from the audience was kind of what did you guys individually do um, when it uh, when Harvey hit, how were you guys affected? Were you um, what exact what activities did you do uh, to try to help folks? And um, not that everyone's Andrew White taking people in their boat, but uh, but what did you guys do uh, uh, as it relates to Harvey? And then let's talk talk about that, and then let's get into some of the details about some of the substantive things that can be done uh, to prevent it going forward. Um, go ahead, Lizzie. Sure. Um... So, like so many others in Houston, we, of course, um, were here during Hurricane Harvey, and we were very fortunate at our own home, um, but as soon as we could get out, uh, my husband and I were both volunteering um, all over town, both at the George R. Brown Convention Center and then also helping uh, friends throughout the community, uh, everywhere from Meyerland up to Kingwood, whose homes had been flooded, um, and friends of friends and strangers. We were out um, you know, tearing out drywall and, and throwing away contents of refrigerators and um, you know, cleaning. I did not know before then what happens to diapers when they get wet, um, but I cleaned up an entire bathroom of, uh, of exploded diapers. And um, so that was very memorable. Um, but you know, we have been working since that, since that time um, you know, throughout the community and really focus. We put our campaign on hold um, to really make sure that we could get out and do the work in this community that needed to be done. Um, but I also realized that one of the best things that I can do after Harvey is beat John Culberson because he has failed us time and again ever since he's been elected. And I've been working hard to do that because he was elected in 2000, or he took office in 2001, and back then I worked at the Alley Theater and we woke up after Tropical Storm Allison to find 20 feet of water in our building. So I know what it's like to rebuild your, a place that you love um, and to wonder what you're gonna do about it. And I spent years fighting with our insurance company over coverage and was working on the lawsuit against our insurance company after Allison, uh, which was the last thing that I did before going to law school and becoming a lawyer myself. Um, so I feel like we have all known that these are issues we need to deal with for many, many years. And John Culberson has been absent until right now after Harvey where he's taken a, a leading role, but he's known the entire time he's been in office and he hasn't funded projects and he hasn't made sure that projects like Project Braze move forward. And we need someone in Congress who's gonna be an advocate for us and who's gonna fight for those funds, who's gonna fight to make sure that we do things differently and that we're being proactive rather than reactive in situations like that. Yes, we too uh, stay dry in Harvey, spent some uh, claustrophobic days inside my house with my young children. Um, I turned 40 during Harvey, uh, which was also memorable. Um, and I, after Harvey, I went to, you know, once you could kind of get out on the streets again, we went to George R. Brown and I took care of the pets. And then we, I went to the JCC and I mucked out a house, which was not really for me. Um, but then I was on Facebook and I saw a friend of mine said, I'm in this parking lot in Northeast Houston, a part of Houston that my father who's lived here for 72 years had never heard of. Um, these people have nothing. So I said, okay, we're going to Costco. We're gonna bring, so we're gonna bring stuff to these people. And when we pulled into the parking lot, I filled my car. We pulled into the parking lot and the stuff was gone before um, I put my car into park. And it was just astonishing that in 2018 in America, there were so many people who had nothing. Many of them were undocumented. They weren't gonna to go to George R. Brown. They, they didn't have bus service. They didn't have internet service. They were just completely stranded in a parking lot of a family dollar store. And so I got into action and you know, one of my, the reasons I think that I'm the person who can flip the scissor is because I have a 
record of bringing new people into the process. Many of you know that I'm the founder of Daily Action, which mobilized 300,000 Americans to take political action in the wake of Trump's election. And, and I tried that same thing. I got home to my computer, and I, I live in West U. Lots of people in West U have money for Costco gift cards, and I said, I need you to give me everything you've got for these people who have nothing. I, I did an Amazon wish list, we got uh, donations from 15 countries in most states, and my mother spent weeks breaking up the boxes. And we set up our own distribution center with tons of new friends and volunteers, and that's, that's kind of who I am. If I see an unmet need, I just get in and do, do the work myself, because there's, two, there's no Red Cross, no Salvation Army, and I wish that the work that we had done for the whole month of September, I wish I could say that made a big difference in, um, everyone's lives, but as long as we have policymakers who don't care about people and who are only beholden to corporations and lobbyists, we will never get any change. And John Culberson is indeed a textbook case of that kind of politician. And I too, after Harvey, said this city needs real change, it needs real leadership, it needs doers who actually get in there and do the work themselves. And I am that person, so thank you. The, 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 county, the county just announced they're going to do a two and a half billion dollar infrastructure plan that's going to be on the ballot in August. Uh, the city of Houston just raised its standards in terms of new construction, um, pushing back aggressively against developers. Um, and so the, the question I would have, the, the third component of that is the federal government. And what role, uh, there's still FEMA dollars that need to be coming in here, uh, while Congressman Culberson um, was a little bit late to it, has been somewhat helpful. But um, what are you guys going to do as far as trying to attract more dollars back? We still need a third reservoir. We still need um, a coastal spine. Um, CD7 has been one of the most vulnerable areas in, in this area for flooding, repeatedly being hit. Um, what will, should the federal response be? What will you do to make that happen? Um, and what do you think the federal government should do that they're not doing right now? Um, sure. So I think that there are a couple of things. And we need to look back and realize that the federal government is actually responsible for most of the flood prevention and flooding infrastructure that we have here in Houston. And it's because after downtown flooded in the 1930s, we built Attucks and Barker to deal with flooding along Buffalo Bio and the Buffalo Bio watershed. But there are 22 watersheds in Harris County, in the greater Harris County area. And we have projects identified that we need to do on all of them. And really what we need to do that, we need money. We need money coming from Congress. There are $311 million worth of projects that have been approved by, that have been submitted by the Army Corps of Engineers and approved by Congress that John Culberson has failed to get the funding for up until now, and it's not clear whether there's enough funding for that. The city bonds will go a long way towards a federal match, but we're going to need a lot of money from the federal government. The other thing we need are people who believe that the government should be doing that, because what we see across the board is that there are a lot of people in government right now who don't believe in the National Flood Insurance Program. We need people who are gonna fight for it, because we need that here in Houston. We need that coverage and John Culberson has not been supportive of the flood insurance program. We need people who believe in FEMA and who are willing to fight for FEMA funding and making sure that FEMA is ready. There are some very specific kind of micro things that I could talk about that would have been done better. I think um, FEMA money going directly to the city of Houston and to Harris County like we did after Ike would be much better than having it go through the general land office in Austin, which is how the Harvey funds are being appropriated, which just adds to the delay. So I think that knowing that those kinds of things are out there and working with the city and the county as a partner um, is really important. We need a member of Congress who's going to work with our community, who's gonna work with Harris County Flood Control, who's gonna work with the Army Corps of Engineers, the city, the county, and other folks to make sure that we are doing things in the most efficient and best manner. But it starts with believing that the government should do it, um, and up until now, John Culberson has not been one of those people. He's not been fighting for those kinds of funds to come to Houston, whether it's whether it's flooding infrastructure funding or transportation funding for Metro. So I think that that's a place where we start. Um, but I do think that there are a lot of projects that have been identified and I've worked um, pretty closely with Jim Blackburn who is supporting me in this race as well as several other lawyers um, that I know who are environmental lawyers about the many things that we could do. They're all 
small pieces of a much bigger puzzle because there is no one silver bullet. There's no one thing that's going to fix it. We need to think creatively. We need to think long term and we need to think big about how we're going to live with flooding. And the other thing I would just add as a contrast to John Culberson is we have to stop denying that the climate is changing. Uh, so <laughs> we need to deal with the reality of what our future looks like living with flooding. And we had some visionaries back in the 30s who could see a different Houston, but we need to do that again. And that's gonna take a massive investment from the federal government. I'm going to start by talking about one specific topic that um, Lizzie brought up, which is the National Flood Insurance Program. Obviously critical to Houston, but we need leaders who kind of think bigger about what's happening. I think it doesn't make sense that taxpayers are paying four times for properties that when people want to move. The owner of four bro uh, Three Brothers Bakery has flooded out four times, is desperate to be bought out and have the federal government help him relocate the business. They won't do it. I have a friend in Maplewood who's flooded out two times. She is waiting to flood out a third time so that the federal government can give her a buyout. I think that does not make sense. And we need to make, be more supportive of voluntary buyouts and helping people relocate when they want to. Because one thing we know is the, res the third reservoir might be the solution, but it also might make matters worse. We really need more green space. We need more green infrastructure. We do need a coastal spine, but we also just need parks and places. You know, they call it in the Netherlands, uh, room for the river. The river's here. It's gonna drown us. We need to make room for it. I think that what city council did yet, uh, last week, uh, voting unanimously to allow a new development with 900 houses on a floodplain, does, I would like to hear the backroom discussions because they do not make sense to me. Part of my plan, I've released a plan called the Create Plan in coordination with Sam Brody, who's a great, um, um, he's at a and Galveston, and he's uh, the smartest person I've heard talking about the coast of Texas and what we need to do to protect it. And he says that we, you know, we, we have to think multilaterally. We can't do anything until we have a cross-regional map of what we need. What Katy does, what Cyprus does, affects what happens in Houston. When they build upstream, we should tie federal dollars to disclosure and to the kind of conversations that are not happening. And I believe my pitch for how we get the money, there are billions and billions of dollars that we need. Unfortunately, because of the accelerating impact of climate change, Florida needs it too. Carol South Carolina needs it too. Puerto Rico, sure as hell, needs a lot of federal dollars they are getting. We need to start what I, I, I've coined the Water in Our Living Rooms Caucus, um, which is a bipartisan coalition of cities and states up and down the Atlantic and Gulf Coast that are acutely affected by climate change to band together to put sort of a price on the pollution that is causing the warming waters and the rising sea levels, and then invest in a gigantic Eisenhower, you know, interstate highway-like infrastructure bill that helps us, but it's not just the hard infrastructure, it's not just the bayous and the reservoirs. It's actually cheap things like football fields to hold water. That's what we need, and we need to do, and buyouts need to be much more common because so many people, I spent, so many people want them and are not getting them. I spent Sunday with a woman in Nottingham Forest whose home value went from 800000 to $350,000 overnight. Um, they're not poor enough to qualify for a lot of the FEMA aid. Most people in her neighborhood do not have flood insurance because they've never flooded. She is mad and she should be mad. And she wants, you know, a federal government that is helping her and a city government that is responsive to their needs. And it's more than just getting FEMA checks cashed, which Culberson is suddenly handing out like candy. It's about looking at the larger picture, actually planning for what we need, and coordinating a coalition of people from all up and down the country who really, really need us to rethink how we approach climate change. Let's, uh, let's, let's just here, we keep talking about this. Um, you both kind of alluded to it about the need for more green space and the fact that um, John Culberson, more than anyone else, was responsible for the, is one of the reasons why we don't have a more robust mass transit system here in, in, in Houston. I, I, I know we've got our esteemed former chair of Metro here. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. So there's been a um, sort of a, a concerted effort to block expansion of rail. Um, I, what is your position on promoting mass transportation, mobility alternatives 
um, here. And do you see that as a viable solution to helping some of the issues we have with uh, transportation flood controllers in general? Uh, let's start yeah, again, Lizzie. Um, I do think that absolutely has to be a priority. I don't know anyone who lives in Houston who wants to spend more time in their cars. Transportation is an issue for everyone in this community, and mass transportation is essential to our community's future. It is essential to our city's future. And John Culberson has a distinctly bad record on this issue. I was absolutely supportive of Rail on Richmond um, way back in the early 2000s and supported it in the 2003 referendum. Uh, now I've talked to enough people to know that that may not be the best plan uh, for Metro going forward. But I think, again, it comes to what is the role of a member of Congress. And for me, my view is that our member of Congress should be a partner with Metro and the city and the county. And Metro and the Houston-Galveston Area Council right now are working on a comprehensive plan for transportation that should come out later this year. And I think the role of a member of Congress is to help support that vision in the ways that we can. What we know is that there is a strong lobby against any federal transportation dollars being allocated and there are people all the time in Washington working against appropriating any money for public transportation. I strongly believe in public transportation and will be an advocate to keep those dollars and also to bring them to Houston. That is something that Culberson has done um, particularly bad. He hasn't just failed to get them, but he's effectively put a reverse earmark in the appropriations bills every single session, making Metro jump through hoops, making Metro go through an audit, um, which it passed with flying colors last time. It went so well that Metro put the information out rather than John Culberson. Um, so clearly it did not work as he intended, but we need to focus on how we can make transportation better for everyone in the city. And I do think it means expanding the light rail lines, getting transit out to the airports, getting transit from the new uh, Northwest Mall where there's going to be the, the new train coming in, the new uh, bullet train coming in. And we still need transportation from um, downtown towards the Galleria. I think those are our key areas and we need people to move because it benefits our entire community. And the needs and wants of our community are definitely changing. I've talked to people out on the campaign trail who live out at Beltway 8 and I-10 who want to take transit into downtown to work and in fact left a job that was 10 minutes from their house so they could take the park and ride downtown. People want it and we should be able to provide it because I think it will improve the quality of life for all of us who are already living here and it will attract more people here. And one of the things I've been saying for a while is that um, this was a major issue for us in the Amazon headquarters chase. And if you were like me, you thought, well, this would be a great place for Amazon to have their second headquarters because we've got two good airports, a lot of nice people, we don't have a lot of snow days. So this is a place where it makes so much sense. We're in the center of the country, this is great. Um, instead, what we have seen is that Amazon didn't come here, didn't even make the top 20, and one of the top issues was that we did not have a good enough in transportation infrastructure to support what they wanted for their workforce. Amazon's not gonna be the only company to do that. People are gonna use that same rationale and we need to prepare for that because what has made this city so great for so long is that it is a welcoming city and if you wanna be here, we want you here. It is bigger than when I was growing up. It is bigger than when my mom was growing up here. It is bigger than when her dad was growing up here. And I think that um, we need to focus on that and really, again, plan for our future starting right now. I agree. Oh. I'm proud to be supported by the esteemed uh, former head of Metro, Gilbert Garcia. And Gilbert's always right, and he says that Culberson can be beat on transportation alone. He has altered the city for the worse over the last 15 years more than any other person. When, he, when we passed the referendum in 2003, federal dollar, fed, the federal government would give $4 for every dollar the city put up. Now it's one to one, if we're lucky. Um, that money, as, as Lizzie said, has been sent other places. It's been sent to Dallas, it's been sent to Denver, to Los Angeles, all cities which have expanded their public transportation systems and have thrived. I have lived in cities with public transportation. It is better for the community to be able to get places without two. Houston has 1.8 cars per family, which is more than any other place in the country. 
I have a one car family. We have bikes and electric skateboards and we do it as, on principle, but it's really hard and it shouldn't be hard. And if we wanna be a 21st century city that does welcome new businesses and people from all over, we have to have a way to get around. And I would argue that, you know, if I were Amazon, public transportation is the problem, but Houston has shut down for two weeks of the last three years because of flooding. But flooding and transportation are intricately connected and until, you know, when I was in Northeast Houston, there were many people who their only lifeline was their car. We lost a million cars during Harvey. You should be able to have a job without a car. And John Culberson is the only person who does not seem to agree. Even Ted Poe, who represents this far right wing district where we're standing, was completely on board with rail on Richmond because his constituents wanted it. People need it. People understand. You know, our office right now is on Post Oak. The bus rapid transit is, I think, the future. I think the, the money for light rail is not there. The bus rapid transit could work really well. Post Oak is a mess, again, because John Culverson did everything he could to slow it down, to add studies and delays and all these things to make everyone hate it. But I'm tired of having our transportation policy written by concrete pours and David Weekly Homes people and all these people building kind of suburbs to nowhere down I-10. I-10 should be like the Acela Corridor. There should be, you should be able to zip down I-10 in a train and get to wherever you need to go much more quickly. I will also say the train to Dallas, it's another example of miss, you know, I'm, I absolutely think that we need um, rapid transit to Dallas. My mother just dealt with two dying relatives and spent, you know, half of her 60s on I-45 driving back and forth. We should have that depot be downtown where people who work can just go back and forth to Dallas and that's what it, that's how it should work but um, we need someone who we need a unified congressional delegation John Culberson is the only person really standing in between a really robust public transportation plan for the city and I will be on the side of the future <laughs> All right, so, um... Let's sort of shift gears and uh, we can sort of end the block when we talk about Harvey and transportation and kind of move over to the economy as a whole and sort of talk about economics um, and sort of a whole variety of issues associated with that. I, I want to start with just kind of a few easy ones um, that should be short. Let's try to keep it to 90 seconds. You guys are both such great speakers, but, uh, but, we, but we want to make it so we can get as many questions in at each block as possible. So where do you guys stand on raising the minimum wage? Um, it's currently, currently hasn't changed in quite a long time. Um, and there's been proposals for $12, proposals for $15. Um, what is your position on raising the minimum wage? Start with Laura. Yeah, I'm on board with the fight for 15. It's, um doesn't work for every community, perhaps, again, we have to ask for the whole loaf of bread. We have to say no one who works 40 hours a week should live in poverty. I made 6.75 an hour when I worked for my college media center. The minimum wage is 50 cents more than that, and I graduated from college a long, long time ago. We cannot count on states like Texas to make the right decision with people like Greg Abbott at the helm. We have to try to pass a federal bill that increases it aggressively and adjusts it to inflation. And I don't mean $15 overnight. I mean it has to be indexed, indexed to inflation to get there soon. I also support an increase in the minimum wage and I do believe that um, it has to be a fundamental priority for us that no American who is an adult working full time should be working for the kind of wages that our current minimum wage is. Um, at, if we increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour, a person working full time would make $32,000 a year. And I think that we all know that it takes a lot to live these days in Houston, which is an affordable city and across the country. So I believe in raising the minimum wage. I do think there's a discussion about whether it can be implemented nationwide. And I think that in cities like Houston, $15 is very doable. And in fact, the city of Houston pays a competitive wage. Um, certainly my campaign, we pay everyone at least $15 an hour because I believe that that is, um, that is a priority. Um, but I also think that there may be communities across the country where that's not the right number, but that's something that should be um, worked through in Congress. So there is a, Hillary Clinton put out a graduated plan that called for sort of 12 to $15 an hour, depending on the community. And I think that that makes sense as a start, but I agree that the fight for 15 makes sense because 
we need to make sure that American adults are not living in poverty, working full time, and we need to make sure that we have programs and assistance available to them in all sorts of forms to help people get good paying jobs. We've got um, income inequality is just a, a continues to be a huge issue. Obviously, the raising of the minimum wage is part of that. Part in the, that plays a critical role in that discussion. There's a net, there's sort of a movement in Congress now on the Democratic side for the federally guaranteed job. There's a very various bills out there that have talked about this. What's your view about that idea, the concept of guaranteeing employment? So I think these conversations are still in their nascent phases. I have a lot of kind of I've been following the you know, Silicon Valley people who want a guaranteed income. I think that we could guarantee a job for every American if we invested in infrastructure on the kind of massive scale that we need. FDR's New Deal was essentially a jobs plan for people who did not have jobs. Those jobs are not there again for many Americans. There's no entry to the middle class anymore. And we need to have massive infrastructure investments all up and down our country, good paying union jobs that allow us to repair all, I mean, we have D, our infrastructure is graded D all over this country. People, bridges are collapsing. It's not, we could wed those two things very easily. And, and I, I support that. Uh, I, I agree with Laura that these a lot of these proposals are in their very early stages, both the uh, federally guaranteed jobs idea and a universal basic income, which I've heard a lot of people advocate for because of the situation we find ourselves in. I think that um, what we need to do now is really focus on making sure that we're keeping our economy strong, um, that here locally we're focused on our economy, and that means continuing to be the energy capital of the world and making sure that we are thinking about the future and what kinds of jobs we can create here and bring here um, that we need to be investing not only in what well, we need to be investing in our public schools first and foremost we also need to invest in apprenticeship programs and training programs that will help people get good paying jobs uh, because I think that there's work to be done and I've talked to um, some leaders of unions actually recently saying that they have apprenticeship programs with plenty of room in them so I think being able to come up with systems that connect people to the kinds of jobs that they want and would be interested in is something Thing that we can help do, um, but I do agree that a lot of these proposals floating around in Congress, the devil is really in the details. Yeah, let's let's sort of talk about education because uh, you brought that up, and I think that's that's a good topic to, to sort of pivot from, from on this since it plays such a big role in the economy. Um, we talked about the need to invest in education. The federal government has an odd role in it in that it sets these regulatory regulatory framework, but doesn't actually fund education. What do you guys, um, what is your position as it relates to uh, the accountability system that exists by, under the federal government, um, sort of the, uh, the, the requirements for test-based accountability? And also, what is your position on charters? Do you, you like them? Do you not like them? Um, what, what, what's your position on, on both of them? I think we'll start with Lizzie. Um. So I think there was a sort of a two-part question, so I'll try to go through it quickly, but um, I do think that there is a role for the federal government to play in requiring accountability for school systems across the country. And what we've seen, unfortunately, in this Trump administration is that this administration is working hard to roll back the protections that so many people have fought so hard for across the board, including in education. It's also true of environmental protections and worker protections. Um, but what we're seeing, especially um, under the leadership of Betsy DeVos is a real, um, a real reversal of guaranteeing that students' rights are protected, that their civil rights are protected, that students with special needs are being properly um, at attended to and getting the proper instruction. So I think that that um, is something that the federal government does need to continue to play a role in because we've seen in states like Texas um, that the state is doing that as well. And um, I do think that the federal government is here to guarantee our basic constitutional rights and mandating equal treatment and civil rights is an essential thing that, that I think the federal government needs to do across the board. Um, as it relates to charters, um, there are 40 or so charter schools here in Houston. There are some very successful charter schools and I think that in some instances those have been very successful. But our fundamental priority has got to be 
funding our public education system and funding our public schools. That comes first. Yeah, so I, I, I used to be a K through 12 education reporter, so I will try not to get too wonky, but the federal government exists, you know, the Department of Education, we should expand its role in that we should fund universal voluntary pre-K starting at age three for every student in this country to watch it. And we should also fund um, free community college for everyone who wants it. That is a way to guarantee people a job. It's not enough in many cases. I agree about the apprenticeship program, some of which are having trouble recruiting students, but they all, you can't get the good middle class jobs that you could get in the 70s just with a high school degree. We need to make a path to the middle class possible for more um, students from all backgrounds. Um, and that is possible, and it's a tiny, tiny fraction of what we just gave away in that um, great new tax bill that was passed. Um, so the federal government also has a role, just as with the Department of Justice, in stepping in when things go wrong. And unfortunately in Texas, things go wrong a lot. Yeah. We, we've all, I mean, we've talked about the 8.5%, the completely random cap on the number of students in Texas that receive special education services. That is one of the biggest tragedies of Texas right now. Kids who don't get the intervention they need early go on to cost us, I mean, they don't care about the morality of it. It is a huge drain on our entire system, and we have to. And I'm glad that Brian Rosenthal at the Chronicle did an amazing series that got the attention of federal authorities. And um, also, you know, there was just a big article, I think, last week about Brian, Texas, and their disproportionate suspension of um, African American students. It's like five to one, even more than happens all over the country. And Obama had started to step in to try to do something about that, and then Betsy DeVos walked in. And she's too busy trying to give vouchers to you know religious schools with my taxpayer dollars uh, to worry about kids, preschoolers who are being suspended. You know, in some cases, kindergartens, kindergartners in Texas. And I would like the federal government to have more of a role in that. As for charters, I agree. I fundamentally support our public school system. That should always come first. But some charters have been very successful laboratories of experimental learning. Uh, but public schools come first, and our state needs to fund them much, much more. Um, criminal justice reform has been a huge issue uh, nationally. Um, what's your view as it relates to mandatory minimum sentencing that still is in, in existence? Um, talk about that, and then talk about your position as it relates to uh, legalization or the decriminalization of marijuana use. Um, I think it is Laura's. Sure, I'm completely against mandatory minimums. It's one of those things we've known hasn't worked over and over and over, and yet Jeff Sessions comes in and tries to make the bad worse. Um, I'm also very much for not only the decriminalization of marijuana, but the legalization, regulation, and taxation of marijuana. And I'm also for overturning every sentence of every person sitting in jail right now. And guess what? They're mostly black and brown convicted of marijuana possession. We need to get people out of our jail. And if we had fewer private detention facilities, guess who gets a lot of money from those? John Culverson. Then we would have less incentive to have so many people locked up. So I think we have to decriminalize marijuana and day one. So as a practicing lawyer, I can tell you that mandatory minimum sentences do not work. And we need a strong and independent judiciary and we put judges in that position in the federal system for life because we trust their judgment and we expect them to apply the facts to the law and to make smart decisions about what it is, what is an appropriate punishment. And federal mandatory minimum sentences set by Congress unrelated to any set of facts is um, not an appropriate use of Congress's time and certainly not good for outcomes in the criminal justice system. And I've felt this way for many years because I have seen it practicing in the courts. Um, we talked a little bit, Laura referenced um, the study in Bryan, Texas, and um, a few years ago I worked with Texas Appleseed to study the school to prison pipeline and study disciplinary alternative education programs in Texas schools. And I organized volunteer lawyers across the state of Texas and I interviewed 
parents, teachers, counselors, and students in HISD schools about exactly that student discipline that ultimately puts students on a path to dropping out and winding up in prison. This is an essential issue that we need to be focusing on. And when you take away judgment and the role of judges, and you couple that with a system where too many students are failed by the school system, you wind up with gross inequities. So I do believe that we should get rid of federal mandatory minimums, and I think we have to do everything we can to address a lot of the fundamental problems in our adjudication of criminal justice and our criminal justice system. When it comes to marijuana, I have looked very closely at what the leaders in this community have said um, and listened to a lot of the constituents who are supportive of medical marijuana, and I think that there are really two different issues. One is the criminalization issue and one is medical marijuana. What Police Chief Art Acevedo has said is that we need to study what would happen um, if we legalize marijuana and that we need to look at the effects but I absolutely agree that DA Kimog has it right in terms of not prosecuting minor possession cases and focusing on dealers. I think that that is the right approach for now, and I think that there's room to grow as we study what the world would look like um, if we were to decriminalize marijuana across the board. I feel like we just spent 40 minutes. I just found the first thing you don't agree on with each other. So that's, that's progress, but go ahead. Why is this to say about oxycodone were on, I mean, if marijuana were on the New York Stock Exchange, then I believe that um, we wouldn't be, it would be, it would be a different situation, let's just say. So there's no proof that marijuana is, does harm and there's in, on the scale that the opioid crisis, which is killing now 160 Americans every single day and we're not doing enough about it. And that's the real crisis in our country, not like, 25-year-olds with a dime bag. <laughs> um, Parkland, Sandy Hook, tragedy after tragedy. Um, A-rated NRA opponent in John Culberson. What's your position as it relates to dealing with just the chronic problem of gun violence uh, in our society? What would you support? What would you not support? Um, do we need new laws? Do we need better enforcement? Um, and be, try to be specific on what you would support if you don't mind. Thanks. Go ahead, please. Um, well, I think that any response to dealing with uh, gun safety and gun violence involves two things supporting good legislation and opposing bad legislation. There's a lot of bad legislation out there. So I think that we need a strong advocate in Congress who is gonna fight back against concealed carry reciprocity, who's gonna fight back against the, the Hearing Protection Act um, in Congress right now, which is designed to legalize silencers. We know that those are not good plans and we know that they're being pushed by the gun lobby, which really represents gun manufacturers who are trying to sell guns and sell um, sell things that go with them. I support common sense gun safety measures and I think the majority of Americans and the majority of people in this community do too. I have been working for nearly a year on my campaign with volunteers from Moms Demand Action and I think that they have done an incredible job as has every town um, and other groups in changing the dialogue and changing the conversation and getting rid of this false choice and false narrative that you have to choose between the Second Amendment and gun safety. You know, the founder of uh, uh, Moms Demand Action says all the time, we don't have to live this way. We don't have to live this way. We don't have to make this choice. What would I support? I would support universal background checks, and so do 95% of people in this country. Um, we know that there are actually more federally licensed gun dealers in Texas than there are McDonald's. So there are plenty of places to buy a firearm with a background check. We don't need to be having gun shows and other things where you can get firearms without um, a background check. We can implement it either way. Um, I have called for an assault weapons ban, and I think that after Parkland, this country is ready to talk about that because of the work that people have been doing over the last five years to get move the conversation that way. But for anyone who's read the articles from doctors who treated people, or if anyone's talked to Denise Slaughter, who's a resident of this district, who's also supporting me in this race and had me in her home last week. She was shot by an AR-15 on Memorial Drive two years ago on Memorial Day. And six months later, we had a shooting at the corner of Wesleyan near West Park. And these are things that our community is talking about, that we are worrying about, and John Culberson has been utterly absent. The first thing he handed to Donald Trump to sign was a bill making it easier for people who've been a judge to have mental illness such that they couldn't control their own checkbooks. 
that those people should be able to buy guns. That is totally out of sync with this district and the kinds of things that we want. So I think there are a lot of other good policy proposals. I don't want to um, go too long on my time, but you know, closing the boyfriend loophole, which a lot of a lot of people have identified um, as a major issue, because the majority of violence, and especially gun violence against women, comes from intimate partners. And we see when we are able to legislate and make sure that people in domestic abuse situations, not just spouses, but also um, unmarried partners that the increase, uh, or that there's a great decrease in assaults against women and death of women who are assaulted by their, their domestic partners. So I think that those are some of the things, but they're certainly not all of them, and it's a constant battle of fighting the bad legislation and promoting good legislation. I don't think it's, in this case, I don't think it's just enforcement of existing laws. It is additional legislation to keep our kids safer in schools, to keep us safer in church, at the movie theater, at concerts, across the board, we need legislation that's common sense, that the majority of Americans already agree on, and we need to push on the places where we don't have agreement and have the conversation about what does the world look like and whether we really have to live this way. So I had the great experience of working on the book Enough, Our Fight to End Gun Violence with Gabby Giffords and Mark Kelly. And it was written um, kind of in the wake of the failure of the Manchi Tuman bill, which was a bipartisan, very centrist effort to close all background check loopholes. Three million guns were purchased this year on Craigslist at gun shows, like through straw purchasers. And that is something, it's actually 95% of people in Texas agree on and 97% of Americans are on board with closing that, you know, all the loopholes. We need to do that the first day of a Democratic Congress. And not only that, but I believe Democrats should run on that. And not just after Parkland, but from the very beginning. We should pass all sorts of, I, I, I saw so what pens that we can do something about it. Every member in Congress on the side of right needs to have this conversation. Do sit in every time there's a shooting, which is every day. And I'm really glad that the, of the leadership of these kids march for our lives. I was honored to attend that with some of our student organizers. I was um, honored to uh, support the students at their walkout, which was last week when they risked suspension to walk out of their schools and say, I've had enough. And it's because of these students that my kids are going to be safer, I hope, in their public schools and their school. Our, our last one. Our last block for this, this time is going to be talking about immigration and sort of immigration related issues. Um, obviously, um, it has been very much in the news as it relates to DACA and DAPA and uh, just enforcement as a whole. Um, what's your position just generally on, first off, 90 seconds please, 60 seconds on comprehensive immigration reform? What are the pathways you see even being able to get it done um, moving forward? Because we, whoever, whichever one of you is elected, Donald Trump will be president of the United States. So, um, how do you see? What would you? What would you like to see? Uh, that's something that could get support for. Um, I'll be very brief. DACA has massive support from both sides of the aisle. We need to find a way for these people. These I say I used to say kids, but most of them are just a few years younger than me, and many of them have been in this country for their entire lives. We have a staffer whose sister is two years older than him was born in Mexico, he was born here. Their lives have been completely different. People are sick of families getting torn apart. So I would first put DACA getting a pass in the years. We have to do that. I think that there's lots of people on both sides who would do that. And if we need to, you know, put a few bricks up of Trump's wall, if that's what it takes, and then wait to impeach him, then we can do that. We have to. But I, I believe that keeping these families here and together should be our absolute priority, and I will do whatever it takes to fight for them. And I'm the one who said I would shut down the government to protect them, because it's not happening right now. So, Jay, I absolutely believe that we need comprehensive immigration reform, and I think that is very much a Houston value. As I've said since I launched this campaign, Houston is a welcoming city, and we are better because of the people who come here, whether it is people around the country, around the world. We have a huge... Um, 
refugee community and we are one of the leading refugee resettlement areas and I think that these are things that make Houstonians proud. What we need to do, the, the short circuit um, answer to your question is, I think that there's a good framework, It's not perfect, but I think we should go back to the 2013 bill that was introduced by Chuck Schumer, um, which the House of Representatives refused to consider, but it was a bipartisan bill, it was the Gang of Eight, had wide support, and um, it set out a path to citizenship, which we absolutely need. We need to deal with immigration issues in three basic ways. Number one, we have got to address the misinformation that's out there about our system who can and cannot come into the United States and immigrate legally, um, and we need to address whether those are the things that we really value. Number two, we need to talk about the system for people who are documented immigrants but who are waiting years and years and years for their immigration uh, process to go forward. There are people who are waiting to get um, their immigration process that have been on the list since 1996. Uh, we have got to do better, we've got to fix that piece of the system, and we've got to deal with undocumented immigrants, and I believe we have got to have a pathway to citizenship for everyone who is here, and we have to pass a Clean Dream Act. I hope that that will be done before next January, because there is wide agreement across the country that we need to protect the dreamers, that we have made a promise to dreamers, and when we ask them to sign up and be a part of this program, and we have to fulfill that promise, but we can't stop there. We've got to focus on everyone who has come into this country and find a pathway to citizenship for everyone that works, that's efficient, and that's fair. Um, one of the reasons, obviously we have, um, one of the reasons why, we, we all know we have a broken immigration system, but one of the, re one of, one of the reasons we've had such a problem with it is, is the, the sort of the, the, the structural problems in the economies in Mexico and Central America. NAFTA is being discussed as being, uh, is being renegotiated. What's your position on renegotiating NAFTA? What's your position on trade agreements in general? Um, are you, do you believe that these international trade agreements are a good thing? Uh, Texas has benefited greatly, but is this something that uh, should continue moving forward? Yeah, I mean, we live in a globalized economy. We need some sort of framework for trade agreements. Like, But the thing that's happening over and over that's happened, NAFTA has benefited a lot of people in Texas, but it's hurt a lot of other people all over the country. And we need to renegotiate it, and we have good faith partners on both sides of the border who are willing to do that. It's just... Trump is more problematic. And I think we need a TPP agreement that was not written for the corporations. I mean, it's like Scott Pruitt, for his EPA things, he just cuts and pastes stuff from the oil and gas companies and might as well have the letterhead on it. Too often our trade agreements are written with no consideration for environmental protections or labor laws. We shouldn't allow currency manipulation. Free trade must be fair trade. And so often in these trade agreements as written, they have left too many American workers behind, and we have to renegotiate them. But we don't want China to eat our lunch, so to speak, by just leaving aside the most um, the largest growing trade arena in the world, which is, you know, the Pacific. Um, I agree that um, when it comes to NAFTA, it's almost 25 years old, and um, there's room for improvement for sure. There were a lot of things that were on the table at the time, and I think that there's an opportunity to get those in in a renegotiation. But I do think it's essential that we negotiate trade agreements uh, because it is a global economy and because it's the only way that we'll have a voice in the things that we care about if we want to participate in the international marketplace. And that means environmental protections. It means protections for workers. If we are not part of the conversation and if we are not insisting that our, uh, whether it's, you know, wage and hour laws, whether it's our environmental protections, um, if we are not a part of that conversation, then we are letting other people, other countries make the decisions about uh, the products that we import or don't import. And I think that there's, we've got to be active and willing participants in those conversations. Thank you. Um, well, we've had, we've had, I think, a pretty good conversation today. Um, so let's 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 leave on that positive note. Um, you guys are agreeing on a lot of things here, but let's do um, take a couple of minutes, um, each of you, two minutes, and just make your final pitch for why why you and not your opponent, because um, I think that's what people want to know. And then um, with that, we will conclude this because the rockets are on. <laughs> so. Uh, 
Laura, why don't you uh, why don't you kick us off? Let's try to keep it for uh, just just two minutes closing. Um, and again, focus why you and not Lizzie and vice versa. My name is Laura Moser, and I am asking for your support in the runoff on May 22nd, because if we want different results, we need to run different kinds of candidates. I am proud to be running an entirely grassroots campaign with 20,000 individual contributions, 1,900 volunteers. We are organizing around the issues. We are talking, I'm very active on my social media, I talk about education, infrastructure, healthcare, flooding, all of these things that affect our day-to-day -day lives. And I believe that we need someone with a loud voice who doesn't shut up until Houston gets what it needs to thrive in the time that comes. As the founder of Daily Action, I am proud, again, that I brought 300,000 people into the political process for the first time. That is the only way we will turn this non-voting state into a blue state, by getting people to show up. I love you in the back. <laughs> That's right. Uh, we, I'm so excited that we have people having block walk parties up and down the district, west and east. We are leaving no neighborhood behind. We are leaving no street behind. And we will not stop until we give every single person in this district a voice and a reason to show up in the polls in November. Because there are more of us than there are of them. But we're not showing up, and I'm the candidate who can change that. Thank you so much. <laughs> So I'm not going to answer your question, why not the other candidate? I'm just going to address your question of why me. And I think that um, we're all trying to do the same thing here. But I disagree with Laura, I guess, in the idea that it's an us and them situation. I don't think it's an us and them situation. We need someone who's going to represent our entire community. And I think that we need to reach out to everyone in this community because I think this community, the members of this community, share so many value and what we've seen is that our discourse has become so divisive that people are unwilling to speak to each other. Our approach in this campaign is to talk to every single resident in this district and in this community and I know a lot of them because I'm a lifelong resident of the district and I have been an advocate fighting for the people who live here nearly all of my life. It's been a privilege to do so in court and I've represented people from across the socioeconomic spectrum and the political spectrum, people who've worked um, in our community for years and I'm proud to have represented people who work from oil fields to boardrooms to hospitals um, to schools I've represented people and I know what it takes and one of the things that I'm most proud of in this race is that my background as a lawyer makes me uniquely positioned to do the work that we need done in Congress we need people who can build consensus on the things where the majority of Americans agree. Like Laura and I both said, 95% of Texans, 97% of Americans agree on common sense gun safety regulation. Let's work with everyone to make sure that we pass common sense gun safety measures. Let's find other areas of agreement and let's get those done. And then let's fight over the things that we need to fight about. And I have always been a fighter and it's what I'm trained to do and it's what I've been doing for Houstonians for years. We have a lot that we do need to fight for, especially in the Trump administration as we watch the rollback of the progress that so many of us have fought for for so long, whether it's women's rights, whether it's the environment, whether it's worker protections, whether it's the, the judicial branch right now rolling back protections in the justice system. What we see across the board is that there are a lot of things we've got to fight for. And in this race, one of the things that I am very proud of is that a lot of people who are supporting me across this community aren't just the elected officials, many of whom have supported me, um, and you probably have a handout with a lot of different members of our coalition in front of you. Um, but what you won't see, I think, on there um, are the lawyers that have been on the other side of my cases, people that I've gone up against in court, that I've fought battles with for years, people whose clients owe my clients a lot of money um, because I beat them. <laughs> and they are getting behind me in this race. They're now knocking on doors, they're making phone calls, they're contributing money because they know that I am the kind of person that can work and get things done and find agreement where we can and fight and win where we need to. And we need to win now more than ever. There are too many of our shared values as Americans that are under attack. And it's time for this district to have a representative that represents all of us. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. One last round for our two wonderful candidates. One, one, for, clap again. Yeah. All right, thank you guys for the whole
Burgers to taste the color.